All right, get rearranged here a little bit. I am so glad you are all here, because if you weren't, I'd just be talking to myself. And that would, I'm so glad to look out there and see so many old friends, and you can take the word old in any way that's appropriate for you. Um, for those of you who don't, who don't know me, my name is Mike Sweeney. For those of you who do know me, my name is still Mike Sweeney, and um, I'm the professor of World Mission and New Testament at Emmanuel Christian Seminary in Johnson City, Tennessee. And uh, just so glad because my wife and I are from out here. This is definitely not my first Wynema week of missions. It's probably my 10th or 11th or something like that, but my fifth or sixth time uh, standing up here and speaking. And uh, I, I'm, just, I'm just delighted to be here tonight. And delighted you're here joining me. When Joe asked me about the topic I wanted to speak on for this week of mission, I wrote back and said, well, let's do a deep dive into the Great Commission. I even suggested an alternate title, uh, why we don't call it uh, the OK Commission. But almost immediately, I wondered if I'd made a mistake. You see, when I was younger, and by younger I mean uh, this past April, uh, I had an irrational aversion to preaching on or teaching about popular well-known texts. I thought, what more can be said that people haven't already heard? What can I contribute beyond the dozens or hundreds of lessons and sermons they've been exposed to already? And you know, other than John 3.16, there's probably no better known text in the entire New Testament than the last two verses of the Gospel of Matthew that we call the Great Commission. But I quickly realized how faulty my thinking was. In the first place, I've come to realize the truth that people don't need to learn new things about a text as much as they need to be reminded about what they already know so that they can respond with an amen, at least internally. Now, if you want to do it out loud, that's fine. You might cause me to lose my place, but I'll recover. I thought back to the most memorable sermons that I've heard all through my life and realized that instead of giving me new information, they brought back to mind things I've already heard about or thought about before, and in so doing, reignited my passion to follow Jesus. So I hope that some of what I say this week will do that for you. And second, I've also come to understand that while it's important to develop messages with your audience in mind, it's even more important to create a message with myself in mind. A message that forces me to think through a text more deeply, to connect it to other parts of the Bible or parts of my life. So I began to look forward to digging into the Great Commission as much for my own spiritual development as what it can do for you. And it's been worth it. I, I'll never hear the Great Commission in the same way again. We should realize, though, that Matthew 28, 19 through 20 is never actually called the Great Commission in the Bible. And believe it or not, it has not always been read as a missions text. In fact, uh, for most of church history, no one referred to this as the Great Commission. For the first 1,600 years of the church, it was mostly used as a creedal text to prove the Trinitarian nature of God. But it had little or nothing to do with motivating the church to mission. We think it was an early Dutch missionary named Justinian von Welts who first coined the phrase the Great Commission in the mid-17th century, but even then it didn't catch on. It was that intrepid 19th century missionary to China, Hudson Taylor, who popularized the phrase in order to recruit other people to support and join him in his evangelistic efforts in Asia. So really, it's only for the past 150 years that people have referred to these verses as the Great Commission. And it's not as if this is the only call to mission in the New Testament. We can also think of Luke 24, 45 through 49, where the resurrected Jesus tells his disciples, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And of course, we read the restatement of that text in Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and into the ends of the earth. 
Now, those are some pretty great commission statements too, aren't they? Or some church traditions concentrate more on John 20, 21 through 23, where Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now that text will preach, even if that bit about retaining sins makes us feel a little awkward. Or we could move to a Pauline text like 2 Corinthians 5, 19 through 20. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We could spend an entire week on any one of these or give a day to each. The New Testament is full of great mission texts because the New Testament is all about mission. And this only makes sense if you think about why we even have a New Testament. All 27 books of the New Testament were written in a world after Christ's resurrection, as churches were being planted throughout Asia Minor and Europe. In every case, the early Christians, like us, lived in a state of in-betweenness, that time after Jesus had died and accomplished the victory over sin and death and suffering through his resurrection and ascension. And yet, looking around, people could see that these ancient enemies, though defeated, still seemed pretty active. We live after Christ's victory, but in the time before its effects are fully realized. So the writers of the New Testament, under God's inspiration, wrote to churches and people who lived in specific places, undergoing specific challenges to motivate and push them to live as Christ's representatives in those circumstances, so that all people would come to know that the victory has been won, and they should place their hopes in the one true Lord who will eventually bring about that much-needed peace and wholeness that we all long for. The reason we have a New Testament is that the world is not yet what its creator wills it to be. So his church has work to do until Christ returns. It's all about mission. But even when we understand the missionary nature of the entire New Testament, we can still see that some texts, like the ones I've just mentioned, seem to hit that topic more directly than others. They have a quality about them that moves us to apply them to the entire church instead of just a local congregation of Macedonia that might need some encouragement. Texts like the Great Commission are so well known because they have a unique power to motivate and give hope to God's people. So we're going to spend the next five days drilling deeply into the Great Commission. And in particular, we're going to see what place it occupies in the Gospel of Matthew. So even though I'll refer to things in the other Gospels or Epistles a few times, for the most part, we're going to live in Matthew's Gospel this week. Because if you divorce these final few verses from everything that has preceded them, you're not going to hear them properly. Now, how many of you, let me see your hands, are either teachers or are retired teachers? Let me see all those. These are some of our heroes here, right? Some of our... So, as you are all aware, all good teachers, and even some of us who merely wish we were good teachers, create lesson plans. And the first step of a lesson plan is to come up with your course objectives. What exactly do you want your students to know at the end of the course that they don't know yet? Or another way to say it is, what changes do we want to happen in the thoughts or behaviors of our students as a result of this lesson? Well, I'm going to lay three course objectives out for you right now. Things that I want you to retain in the back of your mind while we're meeting together this week. And even though all three of them are very important, I got to get my microphone back here in my face here. I seldom hear them mentioned in Great Commission sermons, so I want to spell them out clearly right now. So number one, I want you to understand that the Great Commission is a necessary consequence of Christ's resurrection. Let me say that again. 
the Great Commission is a necessary consequent of Christ's resurrection. Now, I think most people are aware that the four Gospels all have one major thing in common in spite of their differences. The climax of the story in all four Gospels is the death and resurrection of Jesus. Everything seems to lead to that. We find hints or outright predictions throughout the Gospels. If you get to chapter 27 of Matthew and you're surprised that the chief priests and elders want to put Jesus to death, you have not been paying attention. The same can be said for the other three Gospels. You know, some scholars even describe the Gospels as narratives about the death and resurrection of Jesus with an extended prelude. I'm not one of them. I'm certain that the 26 chapters of Matthew before that serve a greater function than merely to point to Christ's death. But having said that, it's clear that with everything else they do, they make it clear that the story is definitely heading in that direction. But it's also clear in Matthew, Luke, and John that we cannot stop paying attention just because Jesus has left the tomb. Because in addition to the foreshadowing of the death and resurrection that's been going on, we can see that the disciples are being prepared for something big. If all that God needed to do was have Jesus die and rise again, there was no need for him to gather disciples and teach them. Those three years walking beside Jesus was training camp. The resurrection appearance at the end of Matthew was graduation day. But that graduation could not happen until after Christ was raised. He could not make the statements he made to the disciples under the old reality, the reality before his resurrection. But post-resurrection, we see clearly how Christ's followers are connected to his eternal purposes. The reason we find these verses at the end of Matthew's gospel is because this is the message he wants his church to hear and remember. And he's been working very hard for 28 chapters to make us ready to hear it. So <clears throat> that's the first objective. Understand that this commission, this great commission, this charge to the church was a necessary consequent of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. We have a mission because Christ has already defeated the enemy, but the world still serves the loser. My second learning objective is this. In order to make disciples, you must first be a disciple. Now, this shouldn't surprise anyone. As far back as Genesis 1, we find every living thing in God's new creation multiplying and producing after its own kind. Turtles produce turtles, gophers produce gophers, maple trees produce maple trees, and here we see that disciples produce disciples. And this has huge consequences for how we carry out our mission. Because being a disciple is more than joining an organization or wearing a label. A disciple is someone who follows someone else, who imitates a mentor. We could use the word student, but that might imply too much of an emphasis on learning information. Perhaps the word apprentice works better for us. Our goal, according to the Great Commission, is to make apprentices, people who will imitate us because we imitate Jesus. But that means that we are indeed imitating Jesus. We are not neglecting our own life of discipleship. Now, you cannot do this with a mass production mindset. You cannot rely on technology to make disciples. It doesn't work for a church to say, well, if we just implement these programs that Saddleback created, we'll fulfill the Great Commission. I'm not saying that those programs can't help, but listen up. Disciples produce disciples. Life touches life. And we cannot have that kind of life apart from staying connected to Christ through regular times of prayer and worship, through reading a scripture, especially, I think, the Gospels that help us to see how Jesus interacted with God and other people. And finally, and this is a sorely neglected subject, but so important for all of us, we cannot have that without spending time with other disciples who are further along this path than we are. We're not just making disciples. 
We are being made ourselves. And that leads me to my final course objective that I'm going to leave you with tonight. Understand that we're still writing the rest of the story that comes after Matthew 28, 20. N.T. Wright talks about viewing the story of Scripture as a play with five acts. The first act is, of course, creation, and the second is the fall, and both of these are very short acts in the Bible. But act three is Israel with its hundreds of years of mixed history alternating between faithfulness to God and rebellion. And Acts 4, of course, is Jesus, his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, which means that Act 5 is the church. We see the beginning of Act 5 in the book of Acts, as well as everything that follows Acts in the New Testament. But we must remember, we are still in Act 5. It didn't end with the book of Revelation. And according to the Great Commission, we're not alone. Jesus is still with us. The Spirit is still with us. We may not have exact instructions on how to handle every issue and what to say in every circumstance, but God has not left us to do it alone. This five-act play pushes us into some inspired improvisation. And we may flub our lines sometimes. We may trip on stage and fat, fall flat on our faces. But God is gracious with us. And so we need to be gracious with one another and with ourselves as we work out what it means to obey Matthew's final charge from Jesus. So those are my objectives for the week. Keep them in mind as we go forward. Understand that the Great Commission is a necessary consequent of Christ's resurrection. Know that in order to make disciples, you must be a disciple and understand that we're still writing the rest of the story. I look forward to being with you. Let's bow in prayer. Our Lord and our God, you have done so much for us in the person of Jesus, and you have not left us alone. We know that we are not just left to our own devices to fulfill this great commission. And yet we know that we still have our own responsibilities. So we ask for your strength, for your wisdom, for your empowerment, for your help as we improvise through this life in writing the rest of this play and waiting for the return of Jesus. And we pray that we will be an encouragement to one another this week and that we will be able to lift one another up in prayer and be a help to one another and celebrate together what you are doing in this world. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.